I suppose one could wonder why I would write a book on um, on grand ambition when we see ambitious people all around us, and and especially why I'm so interested in in refreshing uh, an understanding of human excellence in our particular time, um, and the and and why I why I think uh, such refreshment, such fresh light, is needed in our time. I think on this topic. Uh, moral philosophy and therefore political philosophy is very confused. Um, and I mean by reminding of some very fine discussions, not least some discussions we view now as ancient, um, to, to focus our mind on first-rate treatments of this. Um, one problem is, I think, that what's obvious to us is not well uh, treated by many thinkers among us. Um, we all know that Nelson Mandela is a very great man and has done very great things. Um, he's an example of greatness, of unequal quality, of superior quality, someone people look up to. Uh, but our our uh, fashionable theories, uh, moral and political, have a great difficulty in, in uh, treating this. Um, and I'll just mention uh, a few. Um, sometimes it's thought that we should have equal respect for persons. But how, does that, how is that compatible uh, with the superior quality and our superior respect, our unequal respect, for a man like Mandela. Um, sometimes it's thought that, that um, we should just concentrate on basic human needs, um, that, that's the, that a kind of humanitarianism of that kind is a proper outlook on the world. And, but what about human promise? as well as human basic necessities. And what about our respect for those um, who are, in fact, superior um, at governing us, at talking to us, genuinely superior? I don't mean elitist. Why is it that we tend to suspect um, that, that all people who think they're superior are, in fact, elitist? That's true of, uh, of people who think they're superior and are not. But a very, someone who's a great mathematician and thinks he's superior deserves to be respected uh, as unequal. So theories like this, I think, interfere with our facing up to and appreciating good things around us. I'm not denying bad things. I'm not denying domineering people. I'm not denying... Um, vain people. Uh, there, there are many more of those than genuinely superior people. But there are genuinely superior people in Mandela, uh, Lincoln, um, uh, people like um, uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice. Uh, these are remarkable people and they ought to be respected as such. And so uh, we have a kind of a stigmatism on that issue. Um, I'll add uh, Two other remarks on this on this topic of why our time is in need of this kind of discussion. Um, one is that there are deep difficulties that prevent our thinking, our taking seriously differences of quality. Uh, one difficulty is called relativism. We think it's very dis very difficult to uh, impossible even to distinguish good from bad to, uh, on a r rational basis. It's just my opinion. It's just your opinion. We don't live by that. You can't think that hit it's just Hitler's opinion that he should destroy the Jews. That was terrible. Uh, otherwise, the word Holocaust would have uh, not its, its great meaning for us. Um, but we can't, but our thinkers have difficulty um, overcoming this very great problem. Um, the second thing I want to add is 
how important it is to recover some very great discussions that we now overlook. There are very great books on the topic of, of greatness and, and moral uh, 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 being of a first-rate human being. Very great discussions of that and of the limitations of being a first-rate human being. Um, and it's part of my purpose to uh, restore attention uh, to some of these discussions. Um, I have in mind, of course, uh, Aristotle's wonderful discussion of greatness, of greatness of soul, magnanimity, or other things I treat are Thucydides on a very ambitious man, Alcibiades, or Plato's, uh, Plato has his Socrates cross-examine uh, this same extraordinary and dubious uh, person of grand ambition, Alcibiades. Uh, and then there's another work, which I'll, I'll talk about later, I hope, um, uh, uh, Xenophon's examination of Cyrus. But the, but the point is not the, the exact content of these works. My point is th these are remarkably subtle and interesting discussions. I'll say simply that I engaged in them for my own sake, to understand the phenomenon of of uh, great human beings and their limitations, uh, of honorable ambition and its and and uh, and bad ambition, despotic, nasty, domineering ambition. Um, so it's 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 partly to encourage a re a return to a great resource that I that I wrote, and partly just to investigate the matter, clarify the matter of honorable ambition. Uh, I add that since I treat a lot of people in this book, uh, I've just mentioned several, four already, and I also touch on Hobbes and Kant and Nietzsche. Um, I've had to do a lot of reading, of course, and reading of secondary sources. Um, and here it's nice to be at this university, and it's very nice uh, to have uh, all the resources available that, that uh, O'Neill presents. But uh, I won't go on in this way. One unusual thing of thing about my book is that I return uh, to uh, classical political philosophers. And I even see some, a number of modern political philosophers as a problem. Why should I do that? Simply put, the doctrines that so trouble us now that I've sketched are the residue of the tradition of modern political philosophy which has come to a kind of crisis. Uh, I may talk about that crisis later. Um, and the ancient political philosophers now begin to appear not so overshadowed by the criticisms launched by the moderns, by uh, a Hobbes uh, uh, attack uh, uh, on Aristotle uh, as an old schoolmaster. Um, uh, the ancient political philosophers took, took um, the quality of human life very seriously. For each of us, that is, after all, um, uh, a very important question. What life should I lead? What kind of life should I lead? What should I think? Those things are somewhat open uh, to us. And that, that openness and the various alternatives were taken very seriously. Uh, that's why, that's why um, ancient political philosophy or moral philosophy, Socratic, so uh, Platonic philosophy, begins in dialogue, in discussion. I'm not treating such a vast topic. I'm treating only the question of honorable ambition, of ambition and honorable ambition and I turn to the ancients having thought that the discussions of ambition as just power, a seeking of power, uh, or as domineering, um, uh, are inadequate. Uh, also, the, the seeking of ambition, uh, ambitious seeking as if it's just seeking to do good for humanity, that too is inadequate because each of us would like our own good also. 
and that isn't treated uh, adequately. So I turned, I turned uh, to three books especially. Um, uh, I would say three authors especially, four in, to in toto. Um, Aristotle has a wonderful discussion of a certain kind of ambition. Let's call it the gentleman's ambition. And this, this is at a, can be at a very high level. Uh, Winston Churchill or a Franklin D. Roosevelt or a, um, or a George Washington. That, that, he calls that high level of ambition greatness of soul. And one isn't after petty things, one wants to do something great. At the same time, it involves not just wanting to do something that's praised or honored, it involves wishing to do something that's honorable or good. Aristotle talks about people like George Washington, whose ambition was great as well as good, and good as well as great. He has a wonderful discussion of the, the, what he calls the moral virtue of magnanimity, or greatness of soul. And that, that clarifies the importance of a decent disposition, a good disposition. Aristotle dwells on that. He dwells on the person being honorable as well as honored. On the other hand, it also shows the difficulties in the passion or the desire for honor, and it, even in the good disposition, uh, a, an honorable disposition like that of a Washington. He shows quietly that such a man, there's a great tension in such a man. It's not that it, as if he's, what is the word of some of the commentaries? A prig, a stiff, this, this uh, magnanimous man. He wants to be superior. He wants himself to be superior. And that makes abiding by justice, abiding by uh, being honorable, a strain for him. It certainly, it certainly is a strain to regard, to regard other ambitious people as his equals. Uh, there's a tension between him and, and, and his like. And Aristotle has a wonderful indication of that. Simply put, to, to almost conclude this example, I return to Aristotle because he has the he is the greatest psychologist, or a very great psychologist, of the great man, of the great soul man. I add two or three other points. He shows the limitation of this um, virtue also. This wish for security, this wish for domineering, wish for superiority can tend toward domination, but it can also be very much frustrated. Aristotle educates us, and this man, in the limits of politics. The most obvious limit is this, that most forms of government will look with suspicion upon such a man, even a good one. They, uh, a good, that is to say, a fine uh, man will nevertheless be suspect among many, many political orders. He will also be limited by laws, by the pedestrian tasks that a, that a political man must, must, uh, must provide for. Aristotle, in a way, removes something of the zeal, of the, of the unquestioned zealotry of such a man, the unquestioned uh, forcefulness toward, toward his goal, uh, toward uh, ruling. He shows the difficulties in ruling. Um, and I would add, and he shows the difficulties in just ruling, because opinions about justice vary, and many of them don't favor the predominance of such a man. I add that he encourages th this man to think of the importance of friendship, how precious it is, what one gives up 
in pushing past or above one's friends. He encourages also such a man to think of the virtues of being thoughtful, which requires looking around, thinking, reading, having a having a decent private life, um, having a having time, in fact, to be a student. Um, it it therefore he's. He's, he has a very subtle understanding of such a man and his difficulties. Finally, he shows in the politics that such a man inevitably, almost inevitably, even a decent one, tends toward a certain imperialism. Thinking what he's doing is great, wanting to do more of it, even when he's benefiting people, he wants to expand what he's doing. So there's also an, imperi there's an imperialism also from an opinion of justice or an opinion of what grand to do, as well as an imperialism uh, from, from uh, money or territory or such things for their own sake. That's a, that's a long answer on Aristotle, and I'll, I'll be a little briefer on with, with one or two uh, other illustrations. That's only one kind of, of grandly ambitious human being. There's also other kinds, um, and and uh, Plato in in his examination in uh, Socrates' examination of Alcibiades, um, Xenophon in his examination of Cyrus the Great shows another road taken by classical philosophy, which is to examine the potential uh, king or even despot and try to make him more reasonable, try to make him and those who have to deal with him more aware of the difficulties of what he's doing. Um, I'll just take the example briefly of, of the wonderful Socratic cross-examinations of, of Alcibiades uh, in two short dialogues called Alcibiades. Uh, most people don't now know about Alcibiades. Um, he was the man who pricked up the Athenian Empire uh, uh, for the Sicilian expedition, which was a catastrophe. He was the man who um, turned traitor on Athens when he was called back to Athens for a rigged trial and went over to, went over to their great enemy Sparta. And then he went over from, the, from Sparta to the enemy of both, the Persian Empire. You could say he was twice or maybe thrice a traitor. On the other hand, for each one of these countries, he was the leading statesman, the leading figure in helping them get what they wanted. This is a man who could govern in very different countries. Um, he, he was a man of very great powers. And now to come back to the point, Socrates, in these two short dialogues, which are really quite wonderful to read, Socrates interviews Alcibiades when he's a young, handsome, rich, luxurious, even licentious man. This is very different from the, the gentleman uh, whom uh, Aristotle encourages. One sees grand ambition in a looser and more, in a way, more interesting form. Um, and what Socrates shows, I think, Socrates manages to catch this little man in a dialect, this great youth in a dialectical net, and engage him in a discussion of whether he really knows what he's doing. Um, and the, the uh, the, uh, he shows, he, he suggests that this man wants, in fact, to have power over everyone in the world and to have his name on everyone's lips. Alcibiades doesn't deny this. He then, sh then uh, indicates to him that he does not see how it is that what he's after will contradict many things he also believes. 
example. Alcibiades is in his way a lover of justice, despite, despite denying it. He loves his country, Athens. He lives then, to some extent, for something outside himself. Laws, and customs. He loves his father and he respects his father and his, and his sacrifices. The father died for Athens. Similarly, he shows Alcibiades that he himself would die for a friend. He would, he prides himself on being courageous and prides himself then on sticking up for a comrade. But that's a kind of justice. You could say a kind of, a kind of uh, self-regarding justice, if you want, or a just-like nobility, justice-like nobility. And in a number of other ways, he shows that that this man who thinks, who has pride in himself as so superior, in fact is lacking in knowledge about himself and about the sacrifices he will make. The decisive step is when he shows Alcibiades that his wish to be on top in Athens, in fact, involves him in being on top only of a school of minnows only of many people who don't know very much about what they're doing. And he's content with a kind of second-rate understanding of things. Um, so to make a long story short, here in this dialogue and in the next dialogue in which Socrates tries to remove Alcibiades' turn to divine help for his schemes to be a tyrant. In these two dialogues, Socrates tries to make Alcibiades more knowing, and he considerably succeeds. Alcibiades remains a friend of Socrates for life. And, and although a remarkable and rather uh, dangerous figure in politics, also is without bloodthirstiness, without revenge, without a motive of revenge against uh, uh, for personal slights or on class basis is a more reasonable figure, I think, uh, by virtue of, of uh, what Socrates did. That's a long question and disputed. But, what, but my point in all this is just, is essentially this. One sees, so one, one sees a marvelous account of the psychology of such a man. I'm going on and on on this question, but then seems to me a great purpose of my book is to, is to remind of the riches that are present in these discussions. The last one I'll mention um, has to do with uh, a rather unknown author, Xenophon, and his account of Cyrus the Great. Now, this account, the so-called education of Cyrus, was once regarded as the primary mirror of princes. My own opinion is it's superior account of leadership or management to anything else I know, including the prince, or it's, um, and, and it deserves to be reconsidered as such. Why? Machiavelli is famous for excluding scruples from a serious politicians' considerations. That is, one should, that is, one should aim for what succeeds. One may use scruples, one may use an appearance of honesty or an appearance of faithfulness, but one, one should not take it seriously or live by it. From that point of view, the education of Cyrus is a fuller account of the human psyche and a fuller account of a serious man's uh, career in politics. Xenophon shows Cyrus the Great as wishing just to be just, wishing to be noble or good to his friends and, and help, help his friends, benefit them. Um, and he shows him, uh, of course, as remarkably ambitious, wanting power and a name over the world. 
Xenophon shows him victorious. He, in fact, conquers what became the, the, uh, the Persian Empire and does it in a way that benefits many people along the way. But Xenophon also shows that he gives up much of his justice and gives up much of his nobility in order to accomplish this. When he finally achieves his goal of ruling, it turns out to be a narrow and rather cold despotism with his friends very distant. They're no longer close or they can be hardly called friends. Uh, and his, the more interesting thing is his activities are rather hollow. He, once he has this great power, what does he do with his time? What is his inner life? Xenophon shows two final things. One is that he, in fact, ends up continuing to conquer. He's not content with being the emperor over the, a vast part of the world. To be in activity, he must be conquering more and more, but it's pointless. It's now a kind of pointless activity. And on the other hand, he's destroyed many small and decent republics, oligarchies, monarchies, feudalities, none of them perfect, all of them in many ways weaker than he, but in some ways better than he. Xenophon shows, by contrast, various kinds of rulers who are more decent, more fair, more caring of family. He shows, by contrast, the, the single-minded coldness that's necessary to conquer in such a way, or to be such a, so ambitious. He also shows that this, the last chapter shows, this great empire that was built collapses, in effect, almost immediately upon Cyrus's death. That in destroying everything destroying the independence of so much, he also destroys the strength of his own great accomplishment. Xenophon exaggerates that, but I think the point is basically true. Uh, Xenophon indicates the weakness of Persia, and it's said, I can't say that this is true, it's said that Alexander the Great, reading this, understood that it would be easy for a Greek army suitably, uh, suitably, uh, uh, armed and such to conquer. Uh, that's after reading not just this work, but also Z another work by Xenophon on a similar theme. So to make a long story short, I think we, we get an, a remarkable understanding of the psychology of great ambition, of the peculiar preciousness of honorable and decent ambition, and of the limitations of a political life uh, and of ambition pursued uh, uh, single-mindedly. I suppose it would be reasonable to ask, uh, why would a, a modern scholar like myself not turn back to the resources available in modern uh, thinking? These great thinkers, these great political philosophers who have so shaped um, our modern world, and not least, I'm an American after all, uh, this great enlightened republic uh, of the United States. And I would, um, and I, I would simply say this, that while the achievements of modern politics are extraordinary, it is also true that modern philosophy has tended, in fact, to come to a kind of crisis. Um, and I, I would just give us signs of that uh, uh, crisis, uh, the doctrines that I mentioned earlier and that are very difficult to defend, equal respect for all persons, or, uh, or self-expression as an adequate account of, 
of uh, how one should live. Uh, or to make a long story short, the extremity of the last great philosopher, Nietzsche, who is the origin, after all, of at least of teachings that tend toward fascism or national socialism, and the present that present shadow over all thinking about politics, relativism. To make a long story short, those doctrines, I think, are the inevitable work effect, the inevitable working out of problems that were in modern political thought, modern philosophy from the start. Now let's be a little more simple. The most famous of seminal uh, modern thinkers is Thomas Hobbes. At least modern political thinkers is, is Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes denied that um, we know any, uh, that, that we have uh, any knowledge uh, of, of moral goodness or badness. He understood um, ambition uh, for honor as only a kind of vainglory. And he denied that there was such a thing as, uh, as, as honorable conduct, uh, because that depended, of course, upon, upon, mor upon uh, uh, moral premises. Hobbes, Hobbes instead insisted that, what, that you have to build political science and politics on passions, especially basic passions, and especially the most basic passion, he said, fear. So that everything, uh, and, and by building on that and excluding, uh, may I say, the other inclinations in the human soul, he thought one could have a solid politics that would work. Um, and therefore, he insists that while there's a right to life, in almost everything else, the individual has to be subordinate to, a, to the government, uh, to a sovereign. But my point is, Hobbes' effort to lop off the higher inclination, so to speak, of the soul. But that means that's a lopping off of any inclination to excellence. How can you have a reasonable understanding of excellence if you deny that it exists? Um, and it, it seems to me that that, that, that beginning, uh, which could be some, that beginning of modern thought, which could be summarized in Machiavelli's formula, that, that we have to take our bearings but what men do and not what they ought to do, and the meaning of that formula is the Habas Maxim. We take our bearings from the strong passions that move men, not from the higher inclinations which move reliably only a few men. That beginning is, has worked itself out and not been corrected. Uh, and I'll just indicate a couple of the stages. The great Immanuel Kant tried to restore morality. His target was especially Machiavelli. His effort was, in fact, to restore the place of morality in human conduct, and not least justice. He followed Rousseau to a considerable extent. But his understanding of morality was respect all is equal, to make a long story short. He took over from Hobbes the notion that we're all basically equal in our in our basic in inclinations or our basic passions. He took that over and, and held that dedication to that equality, uh, acting according to a maxim that can be universalized, that all can follow. Dedication to that is, in fact, morality. But that has many, many difficulties. And the gravest difficulty is it insists above all upon equality and, and, and equal respect 
And that, that in fact, downplays the importance of unequal promise, unequal achievement. Um, also, it's very hollow. It doesn't say what's good and bad. Um, after all, it could be that it's beneficial. Um, it could be that, that one could say cannibalism is something that people do, that people should do to keep the, take care of the population problem. And therefore, the maxim of cannibalism ought to be universalized. That's strange, but the mere universe Personalization uh, doesn't unfortunately distinguish between good things and bad things. The, the, um, uh, the third stage, if I may put it this way, in the development of modern thought uh, comes with Nietzsche. If, if Hobbes wants to return to uh, just, uh, sorry, if Machiavelli, if if Immanuel Kant wants to, in fact, restore a concern for justice and, and morality, taking it seriously, um, then Nietzsche wants to, wants to restore a concern for superiority and the noble. You could say the ancients' concern for the nobility comes storming back uh, in Nietzsche. But Nietzsche also wants to have what, Machia what uh, Machiavelli, in fact, had advised, a reliable source in a strong force. He doesn't want to take his bearings from, the, from opinions of right and wrong, which vary a lot and which have to be dialectically considered, according to the ancients. He wants instead to, to take his bearings from something that is, quote, un real, unquote, and that is a is then a passion or a real moving force. And that force is, of course, the will to power. So Nietzsche then presents a kind of brutal will to dominate, a, as if that were the noble. He can say both that Napoleon and the blonde beast, or uh, are, are, or a spiritual will to power and the blonde beast are manifestations of this. And this, this leads to the notion that one wants der Führer, the, the leader, is what's important, which is, is, has difficulties that are now famous. But to state them in theory, what's important is to dominate and even cruelly dominate and what one is for, what values are one is for, that's, that's unclear. That will come out in the future and just above all justifies domination uh, or follows domination. I add one other point. It was Nietzsche who saw that a kind of relativism followed from this, from, from modern thinking. I'll put it in my own words, not his. Suppose you say that we ought to, we ought to follow what men do, not what they ought to do. But what, and then you could say, well, what men do is moved by the passion of fear, or moved by the passion of gain. But which is it? Which passion should one follow? How about erotic passion? And, and. People's, what people follow, what they incline to, is affected by their opinions. So uh, the, the, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who wishes to rule or dominate, has a very different opinion and very different direction than Thomas Jefferson, who wanted to win the election of 1800. Very different indeed. The... The, the, the result is that if you turn to what people do, it's various. And therefore, one could be led toward the opinion that there's then no way of judging what, what values. It's, as, as 
came to be. So it's historically relative. Or if you believe in science, Nietzsche, I think, questioned our belief in science also, that then, then science can describe facts but not values. Um, and then the value of science is questionable. Uh, the result is the development of a deep, corrosive, underlying skepticism. Every one of the opinions I've mentioned is characteristic of modern times, of, of our time, I don't say modern times, of our particular time, uh, is influenced by this deep skepticism. Um, you should live an authentic life, but of course that's what's authentic to you, to yourself, or you should express yourself. But what yourself is, is of course uh, unique. Um, uh, um, and and uh, one, one could say more on this. The result is, I think it's fair to say, a kind of crisis of modern moral and political thought. Um, and, uh, and to return to the resources of the past within modern thought may not get, will not get one beyond these, this, these difficulties, I think, that I've tried to sketch. Um, in a in a very sketchy way by talking of the of these three stages of modern thought. Having talked of of uh, rather abstractly of these of these philosophic <clears throat> doctrines, um, uh, I should mention uh, some of the really interesting examples that are that are present presented in the book, and I do rely on examples. Um, but they're not, they're not everyday examples. Um, uh, Alcibiades, uh, Cyrus, uh, George Washington, I mentioned more slightly, people like Mandela, Margaret Thatcher, uh, others. Um, why do I turn to these examples? Well, there are two reasons. The lesser, there are two reasons that the examples show different kinds of ambition. And the examples are discussed by masters of, of uh, investigation. Um, and I followed wanting to examine those masters. I looked at the examples they took up. The first reason is, uh, uh, is in a way evident. The very gentlemanly, although remarkably passionate George Washington, is very different from his great rival of modern times, Napoleon. And his, his, um, uh, and uh, the Napoleon-like character, uh, Cyrus the Great, uh, and the, and uh, Alcibiades. Um, Washington was remarkably respectable in his private life. Alcibiades was a terror. Uh, his wife uh, wanted to divorce him uh, because of his, of his many runnings around with every sex. Um, and uh, uh, when she came to the courtroom, Alcibiades marched in, picked her up, and took her away. Um, uh, when his dog, when uh, uh, his dog was much admired, uh, but somebody else's dog was admired more, so Alcibiades cut off his tail uh, to make it more a subject, more, make himself more a subject of of uh, conversation and such. He was famous for his luxurious lifestyle and spending, to put it mildly, beyond his means or maybe his country's means. Uh, this is a man who entered, if I remember properly, four chariots in the Olympic uh, chariot race, where cities raced or tyrants, not private individuals, and three of them won uh, a, a some prize, including first and second. And, he's just, and, and one of them, the fourth uh, that he entered, had been stolen or borrowed from someone else without their knowledge. I mean, he's just, just in a way outrageous. And at the same time, an enormously talented man, enormously gifted. Uh, Alcibiades went, as I mentioned, from from Athens to Sparta to Persia, 
and was the leading figure in every one. After he, after, uh, leading figure in their war efforts, uh, after he defeated, after going over to Sparta, he was responsible for three, perhaps four, of the four measures that defeated Athens in the long run. It's extraordinary. Um, and yet, when he came back to, to Athens, as he wanted to go back, he also uh, uh, resurrected uh, uh, Athens' uh, uh, war effort, in fact, defeating the Spartans in all kinds of ways, and restoring Athens to a kind of primacy. And it, was just, it was just remarkable what he did, a temporary primacy, until he was kicked out again. The Athenians couldn't stand it. It's, that's a figure that is, is, is just a kind of extraordinary indication of great ambition. Um, and, and to see that one in the flesh and see its qualities is, is it's, uh, illuminating. Cyrus the Great, on the other hand, is, a, is portrayed by Xenophon and the education of Cyrus as the model of how rationally to master the world. His mind is always on the main chance and the next step. And therefore, while Alcibiades is a constantly engaged in affairs, he was kicked out of Sparta largely because um, uh, the king, uh, for understandable reasons, uh, was irritated that he was sleeping with the queen, and that, that is, Alcibiades was sleeping with the queen, and in fact, she was going to have a child by him. Which, um, uh, whereas Alcibiades was of this temper, uh, Cyrus was a cold king. He captured the most beautiful woman in Asia, according to Xenophon's wonderful account, and would not even look at her. He was offered a completely charming uh, and prominent uh, young lady for his wife he was not interested. He's a cold, he ended up marrying, it's quite possible at least, according in Xenophon's account, an old lady who was, however, extremely well connected. Uh, uh, and, and got him the, the easily the kingship of, of, uh, of uh, Media, Medea. So one sees these different types. One can also see them in Shakespeare. Augustus, the cold emperor, as opposed to uh, as opposed to um, uh, uh, Henry V, uh, the warm and charming uh, 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 man of ambition, uh, not to speak of Harry Hotspur, uh, uh, and you can see many such types. So, these different examples serve a purpose and a useful purpose. Uh, and I've mentioned, I've mentioned Washington. But I chose at least two of them, and perhaps three of them, because they're the subject of discussions by masterful writers. And therefore, the qualities that I've mentioned in them are brought out by these writers. I'm not now saying that these are accurate, perfectly accurate biographies in the historical sense. They were never intended to be. Um, yeah, uh, in particular, uh, the Cyropedia differs in many, many ways from Herodotus's picture of, of, uh, of Cyrus the Great. Uh, many, many ways. He's much more rational. But they're an exhibition, or rather an, uh, that book is an in investigation of what ambition is at its most rational. Not gentlemanly ambition. That moderates it by habits and dispositions. But the passion for great ambition is that it's most extensive and most rational. Uh, and that, um, and that's explored in the book. So it's more a political exploration or a moral and political exploration than it is a history. But it's a wonderful one. And I hope I've conveyed that uh, before. The same is true, of course, of Socrates' cross-examination of Alcibiades. And I had one other work which I haven't mentioned. Alcibiades is, is discussed, of course, by Thucydides in his wonderful history. Um, and there you see something more of the political consequences which in, which of, of such a man. 
I would say a tendency towards empire, which I've mentioned, a tendency so towards rivalry and strife within a country as as Alcibiades tries to rise above the other leading political figures, um, and a tendency toward civil strife in countries outside one's native country also, because this man is constantly, he's imperialistic, he's wanting to, to, to enlarge things, and that inevitably Inevitably, that means favoring this side or that side in, con in, in, uh, in countries without. Thucydides has an extraordinarily interesting diagnosis of the effects of Alcibiades. Um, I want to add that Thucydides, this very great political historian, never criticizes the statesmanship or the generalship of Alcibiades. My own opinion is he doesn't even blame him returning traitor, because this extraordinary man whom the Athenians needed would have been brought home for a rigged trial on, on, uh, on superstitious grounds, and it would have been the end of it. Uh, and he left for good reason, but that's a very controversial judgment, and I will, I will just say that at least one will not find in Thucydides a criticism. Uh, of Alcibiades' public life. On the other hand, one sees in Thucydides a very quiet criticism of his private life. His private life, his excesses, his being the playboy squared, um, in fact made people suspicious of him, untrusting of him. And they also suspected that he wanted to become his terrific ambition. Uh, made them suspect that he wanted to become tyrant and, that, and was dangerous. Uh, but I'm, I'm less concerned to, to now to indicate the content of, of Thucydides' remarks than just to point out the, ex, the extent, the, the illumination that one can get about such a man uh, from, from, uh, from, the, from these authors. So that's a reason for, uh, there's a reason for picking at least two of the three. And I would just add, with respect to the great old Chief Justice John Marshall, the American Chief Justice, uh, uh, there too I use, use the discussion of him by, I mentioned Marshall, because he was the author of a biography of, of George Washington. And I pick, I, I discuss Washington especially because there is this fine account by Marshall of, of Washington. That is to say, Washington knew him was part of his uh, new Marshall. Marshall was part of Washington's entourage. And, and uh, this work then helps, and, and uh, uh, Marshall is a great admirer of Washington's character. And I wanted to dwell on that and compare that to a modern historian um, uh, who emphasizes Washington's love of fame, or rather the founder's love of fame. I think one has to talk also of uh, of of uh, the very the importance of his gentlemanly character too. The simple answer is I'd like them to be wiser about such human beings and more appreciative of the honorable and great statesman. The, the, that is, I should consider, of course, what I want the usual reader, student or um, general reader, to take away from the book. Um, that's an obvious question and one that, that um, uh, has, is, has been in my mind. So, one thing I'd like them to take away, which I've just mentioned, is just be, be more appreciative about such people when they appear. Also, be wiser about one's own ambitions and others, and understand the painful things and the unpleasant things one is likely to take on if one gives oneself up to a political life. 
these books are also very instructive as to how to do it, and and therefore I'm I, these studies that I've I've uh, looked at. I add two other things. I hope to help alleviate the intellectual confusion of many thoughtful people um, who have judgments and even and about things and yet are reasonable people, thoughtful people. They have judgments about what's wise and what's not and yet are hesitate, hesitant to stand up. They doubt their own opinions. They they are skeptical whether one can know good and bad, and they're, they're, they're reluctant to stand up. I would add, uh, I'm especially interested in encouraging statesmen-like people to have the confidence of their convictions, if they're decent people and mean to do well, uh, to have the confidence of their connect convictions in standing up against the pressures of public opinion and of fashion. Um, so all of those rather practical things were in my mind a bit. But I have to say that the most important thing I'd like to encourage is respect for an interest in these great old studies of these matters. Um, I myself uh, entered into this uh, study for my own sake. That is to say, I wanted to understand ambition, and honorable ambition, and, and the limitations of an ambitious life. Um, and I wanted to read then these books and, re and, and penetrate them. Uh, I have a deep love for the books and for that kind of understanding. I would be happy if I encourage in others that kind of taste. Uh, and also, if I've afforded some introduction to these works so that people can pursue them and read them on their own. Um, so I would say the two greatest uh, benefits I hope are might be forthcoming from my particular effort. I don't claim that mine is the only effort in this line or that I'm so original in, in what I've said. But if I were to claim any benefits, I would say to help guide people out of, thoughtful people, out of the intellectual confusion of the present time. At once appreciating their country appreciating the limitations of any country and grasping uh, 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 and, and seeing a road to understand what's good and bad, what, what's true and what's false in understanding politics. But finally, uh, to give people a, a taste for these very great works of literature, which, which uh, I think are so rewarding, and that have been covered over by um, they've been covered over by our confidence in progress, by our confidence that, in fact, thought has progressed. But I would say that confidence uh, can no longer is no longer so present at a time of deconstruction, when postmodernists are think they dance upon the ruins of of the development of modern enlightenment, uh, and at a time of relativism, when it's very difficult to know what to think, and it's not clear that we can know what to think about, about the important choices of human life. And we, it behooves us to go back to works that were at the beginning of the attempt to think things out, and are then more fresh, and without the particular difficulties under which we suffer.